And we're back. We've had to plug the phone in, so we have a new angle happening here. Hopefully, we can hold the phone for all this time. Main Street Manifest, May 28th, 1936. And we're in the? Great Depression. And so it's about summer, and that's one of the hottest years ever. Yeah, May 28th, so coming up on summer. An honest-to-goodness spy map, cried Letty, as the three of us crouched behind the wooden Indian in front of the hardware store. Right here in Manifest? Why, I've never heard anything so exciting. I kept the mementos hidden away in the cigar box, but I showed them the first letter in the spy map. It must have been a little selfish of me, or it might have been a little selfish of me, but I wanted to read the other letters by myself before letting Letty and Ruth Ann see them. Maybe there would be some mention of Gideon in those. The Rattler. Ooh, that sounds mysterious as the Shadow. Ooh. See, there it is. The Shadow Knows. So, they knew about the radio show. Yeah, it was on, man. Everybody listened to The Shadow. Letty took on the deep, dramatic voice everyone knew from the Sunday night radio broadcast. The Shadow Knows. Look. Oh, who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The Shadow Knows. Ooh. Was that the song? I don't know. Oh. But it sounds good. Figured it was. Ruth Ann rolled her eyes. Now, I feel the need to clarify that Mr. Lazalier was not alive in 1936. I was not. He was not. So, My mother was born in 1936. My father was three. Right. So, I mean, you're old, but you're not that old. Yeah, I'm old enough. <laughs> um, in fact, Letty continued, it's just like that episode a few months ago. A lady, she gets mysterious letters from her dead husband. Well, they're not letters, really. They're more like notes because they don't come in the mail. They're just left under her pillow. And right before she goes insane, now, now, oh, not now, Letty, Ruth Ann said. The Rattler, whoever it is, could still be here spying on us this very minute. So the shadow sounded like a creepy show. It was, yeah, yeah it, was, it was creepy enough, I guess. After all this time... The shadow was a good guy. After all this time, the letter was written... Letty did the calculating in her head, because remember that said 1917. Uh, 18 years ago. And I don't see how this map is going to help us. She looked over the paper. It's just a map of manifest, or at least manifest as it was back in 1918. See here, that Matinopolis meet closed down forever ago. The cousins' debate continued. Ruth Ann said, so maybe it's a map of likely suspects and places the spy might frequent? Maybe he's dead by now. The Matinopolis place is on there, and Mr. Matinopolis is dead. Maybe you shouldn't be such a stick in the mud. Come Maybe on. Maybe Mr. Matinopoulos was the rattler. Maybe you shouldn't be such a stick in the mud. Come on, let's scout around. As we all got up, I figured Ruth Ann had won. And from Letty skipping along beside us, I gathered she didn't mind. We looked up and down Main Street, taking in store owners and passersby. There was the butcher hanging up a big hunk of meat to cure outside his store. He pulled the fleshy meat hook and wiped it on the, his already bloody apron. The ice man whacked his spiky tongs into a block of ice and hoisted it out of his truck. Okay. okay. This needs a little explanation. The ice man. The ice man. So before refrigerators like we have now, people had ice boxes and you would hire an ice man to bring you a chunk of ice and they would use these little ice hooks to pick up the chunk of ice and you said it could be what five pounds ten pounds usually it was all at the least, way to 50 at least 10 pounds but if you needed more they'd bring more and so what they would do is they would ice harvest because there was no freezer at this time mm -hmm. so they would ice harvest so they would go to frozen lakes wherever they were at that time and they would harvest ice from the top of the lake mm -hmm. and they would then carry it to places like manifest and they would pack it in like straw in very well insulated trucks or on trains or on trains yes trying to keep it frozen and then you would order it 
from, I can't imagine that it was a, an, an extremely efficient way of doing things, but it worked. It was the only way they had it. Correct. And so people had ice boxes, which was an insulated, kind of looked like a refrigerator in a, in a little bit, like a small one. But then you would have a compartment where you would put your ice and then it would just kind of radiate that cold, kind of like packing a cooler Make for the sure beach the now. door is closed. You put your ice in there. Uh, ice is in there. Even though it very slowly melts, as long as you leave the door closed, it makes everything inside there cooler cold. and cooler and eventually colder. Yeah. And if you put stuff down close to the ice, it makes it really cold and may even freeze it like what's in our freezers today. Right. Now... Also, they had these circulating fans called oscillating fans that were metal, and you'd plug them in, and they would they would they would go all over the room. But they might be kind of small, so if it got really hot later in the summer and you had any ice left in your ice box, you might take it out and set it on something in the room and let the fan blow over the ice to try to blow a little cool air through your house. Or if you were smarter, you just left it in the ice box and you'd go outside. Okay. And sit in the shade. And then when your ice melted, then you had to order more ice. Yeah, and by the time the we get to July and August, the ice men didn't have any more ice. They were out. They were out. Couldn't You couldn't bring enough ice down because you'd have to go all the way up into the mountains and Canada, and you just you just couldn't get it. And by the time they would get here with it, it's so hot it would be it, it wouldn't, melted. Yeah, yeah. so you by yeah. the time, really by, probably by early to mid-June, there was no more ice to be had for the rest of the summer. And then you couldn't get oh, any until I can't imagine. you get into the fall. But by that time, at least your weather was going to start cooling off. I can't imagine. Um, let's see. The barber shook out his apron and wiped his razor blade clean. Thinking of spies and people going insane made everyone seem a little frightening. There were, there were, uh, I'm sorry, they were like nameless men in a scary nursery rhyme. The butcher, the ice maker, and the barber until Letty identified them as Mr. Simon, Mr. Pickerton, and Mr. Cooper. We made our way into and out of a few stores, asking if anyone had heard of the Rattler. No one seemed inclined to shed any light on the matter. The Rattler could be any of them, Letty breathed. But I still say the Rattler could be dead and buried by now. Mr. Mop Metropolis or... Matinopolis. Matinopolis, sorry. Or maybe not, Ruth Ann said with authority, look... It was the Undertaker, all dressed in black. Okay, so we talked about this in class. The Undertaker is like the owner of the funeral home who would be responsible for assisting families when someone in their family passed away and having the person buried. He would prepare the body. He'd put it in a casket. He would measure the person and, and make a casket just for their size. And then he would go dig the grave, probably with a couple of ruffians that would help him. And then they would be ready to... Like, no. His Apple Watch is going crazy. Um, but he would um, then have the funeral for the family. So anyway, um, it said the Rattler could be any one of them. But I still say the Rattler could be dead and buried. Or maybe not. Look, it was the Undertaker all dressed in black hauling a slab of granite into the Better Days funeral parlor. Maybe it's Mr. Underhill, Ruth Ann whispered. He's always itching to carve somebody a grave marker. Maybe he even killed a few bodies himself. The letter didn't say anything about murder. We're just looking for a spy, right, Abilene? Letty asked. Yes, but... But what, Ruthann asked. Well, say there was a spy. What do you think he was spying on? Letty and I looked at Ruthann. She rolled her eyes and gave a sigh. She, like, she was disgusted to have to explain even every, something so simple. I figured she was just stalling till she could think up an answer. There was a war going on, you know, Ruth Ann said. We kept staring. And in wartime, there's always secrets that need keeping from the enemy. Still staring. So what makes you think Manifest didn't have a few secrets of its own that some spy might want to find out about? Ruth Ann asked. Since Letty and I couldn't come up with a better explanation, we shrugged and turned our eyes back to Mr. Underhill, who'd come outside. He wiped the sweat off his forehead and looked up at the cloudless sky. Look at him, Ruth Ann said. 
He's sniffling for death. He's sniffing for death in the air. Oh, <laughs> well. A breeze picked up, and when Mr. Underhill crossed the street, walking in our direction, I thought for sure he'd pluck one of us for that new grave marker. We backed into an alley and watched as he passed by. He hunched forward, and his arms didn't move as he walked. They just hung stiff by his sides. Come on, Ruth Ann whispered, and we all three took off after Mr. Underhill. He headed to the edge of town and skirted around the trees near Shady's place. Letty stepped on a twig, snapping it in two, and Mr. Underhill turned around. We stayed still in the darkness of a tree until he moved. Where's he going? I asked. Well, where else would an undertaker go? Ruth Ann pointed ahead to the wrought iron fence that surrounded hundreds or maybe 50 or so graves. Come on, there's an opening on the other side. So they're headed to the cemetery. cemetery. This was one of the universals I had so far avoided. In other places, I'd seen kids who followed their leader like blind mice right into the carving hands of the farmer's wife. <laughs> Being an outsider, I didn't usually fall under the leader's spell, but I'd never been on a spy hunt before. So here I was traipsing after Ruth Ann, enjoying the excited, scared feeling that made my spine shiver. Ruth Ann went first, squeezing through the fence where there was a missing iron rod, then Letty, then me. Over here, Ruth Ann said, crouching behind a tall tombstone. We followed, then waited and peeked. Mr. Underhill plodded over to a grassy spot between two graves and stretched his arms between the markers. His fingertips barely brushed the stones on both sides. I'll be hung if he didn't lie flat on his back then like he was ready to die himself. From our hiding spot, we could only see his knees poking up as his long legs butted against another grave marker in front. He lay there seeming a little too comfortable. Then he got up, made some notes on a pad of paper, and arms hanging down again, walked out of the cemetery. So what do you think he was doing? He was measuring for a grave. He was measuring for a grave and using his body to do it. We waited for the gate to quit squeaking before we gave up our hiding spot. He's measuring for somebody's grave, Letty said. Ruth Ann looked over at the grassy space Mr. Underhill had recently occupied. The way his legs were bunched up looks like there's not enough room for a full grown adult. She stretched out her arms, measuring length as the undertaker had done. Then with one hand about the same height in the air, she turned real slow. In fact, I'd say there's probably just enough room for somebody about the size of one Saletta Taylor. She placed her hands on Letty's head. You stop that right now, Ruth Ann McIntyre. I'll tell your mother that you used her colander for catching tadpoles. Ruth Ann laughed. Oh, don't get your knickers in a knot. Let's go home, Ruth Ann, Letty said. I'm thirsty and Mama will be awful upset if she finds out I was clear out in the woods. It must be near midnight. For heaven's sake, Letty, it's barely dark. Still, Letty whined just a little. Oh, you're probably right. Supper will be waiting at my house too, said Ruth Ann. I hated to see them go. Maybe we can find a creek to fill our pop bottles, I suggested. There's nothing more than a trickle with a hundred miles within a hundred miles of here. Everyone knows that, said Ruth Ann, kicking up dust as we walked. My daddy said he'd heard the drought had taken hold here, hadn't taken hold here like it had in other parts. It's bad enough, she answered, stuffing a wad of grass in her lips like tobacco as we made our way back to Shady's place. Still, said Letty, Uncle Louver says folks around here are lucky. Least there's underground wells to draw from to keep people watered or to keep people watered. He says places not far west of here are so dry people shrivel up like November leaves and blow all the way to California. Highlight that people shrivel up like November leaves. That's another comparison using like or as so a simile. And what does it mean if they blew all the way to California? It means they packed up their car like we saw in our PowerPoint. They packed up their car, took all their, took all their worldly possessions, and went to California where they thought they could find work, work, a better life opportunity, no, no drought. Dust, no drought, no dust bowl in California. Correct. We started back toward the treehouse to get Ruth Ann's pack. 
I'm tired, Letty groaned. Nice to meet you, tired. I'm hungry, Ruth Ann answered, pulling a half-eaten apple from the pack. Truth was, we all seemed to be getting a little tired of the spy hunt and probably would have dropped the whole thing right then if it hadn't been for what happened next. When we got back to Shady's property, we saw that there was a note nailed to the trunk of Fort Triconderoga at eye level, right on the knobby bark. Someone didn't want us to miss it. What's it say, Letty asked. I tore it off the nail and adjusted the paper to read it in the dimming light. There were only four words written on it, each one capitalized. It read, Leave well enough alone. It was more jarring than scary, but it was scary too. To think that somebody not only knew we were on the trail of the Rattler, but had taken the time to write a note to three girls. What had we stirred up? What was the writer of the note afraid of? That means the rattler's still here, Ruth Ann said, alive and kicking. She took a bite of apple. How can you eat at a time like this, Letty said with a shiver. He knows we're looking for him. Ruth Ann continued munching, pondering the situation. Maybe we shouldn't have come right out and asked about the rattler. It was a little late for that revelation, I thought. What are we going to do now? Um, what are we going to do now, Letty repeated. Aren't we going to leave well enough alone? Ruth Ann looked at Letty like she'd given the wrong answer to two plus two. Of course, we're not going to leave well enough alone. We're going to start up our spy hunt again first thing tomorrow. I put the note in my pocket for safekeeping. We made plans for Letty and Ruth Ann to come back the next morning and said our goodbyes. The saloon church looked warm and inviting with its light glowing through the stained glass windows, but I wish Gideon was there waiting for me to say good night to me. I reached for the compass to hold, but it was gone. My heart pounded, and even though I hadn't moved, I felt like I'd lost my bearings. The compass was my most valued possession, and I'd lost it twice in two days. Highlight that. The compass was my most valued possession and I'd lost it twice in two days. I must have snagged it when I'd squeezed through the cemetery fence. The cemetery. Now, do you want to shut that door so we don't have that helicopter 